birthday, Orchestra Iowa. You don't look a day over 98. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, for our, to, our, uh, to our presentation today. By the way, I got nothing but trouble today because I got a special guest who's probably uh, no stranger to anybody. Uh, he was the uh, CEO and president of Orchestra Iowa during probably the most transformative years in the history of the almost 98 years history of this orchestra. He then went on to be a president and CEO of Jacksonville uh, Symphony and then on to president and CEO of Louisville Orchestra and now he's the president and CEO, e CEO of Innovative Arts where he's been consulting with orchestras during the pandemic that are in distress and there are a lot of them. So joining me today is somebody who's no stranger to you. Say hello to Mr. Robert Massey. Robert Massey, welcome home sir. Thank you very much, Jim. You look ridiculous. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I tried. Yeah, well, okay, so. And you don't look a day over 97. Well, that's true. So there's an inside joke, because he's wearing a green hat. And I remember when you were here, we were uh, working on our logo, and you spent a good six months trying to figure out the shade of green. And so the running joke was always 577 seven green, which was the kind of shade of green we ended up with anyway. So, in your honor. Uh, five seven seven green, sir. Thank you. Okay. It's more of a five um, seven eight. But, yeah. So um, <clears throat> where to begin? Well, first of all, back in the day, uh, our drink of choice was the old fashioned, and in Cobble Hill they make a variant of it called the Old City, and this is something we used to drink like water. So in your in your honor, we have this. So cheers to you, sir. Thank you very much. Cheers. So, so everybody at home, I want you to report in to see what you're drinking tonight. Um, and please uh, include your questions so that we can answer what's been going on in, in Robert's life and what's the latest in the symphony business. Because overall, what I want to talk about this hour, if you're an encapsulator, I want to talk about change. Change is a constant. Change is inevitable. We can be the agent of change. Sometimes change is thrust upon us. And I would argue that symphony orchestras are notoriously slow to change at their own peril. So um, I'm not sure if you want to start this historically about what you came in here. No, let's, let's work backwards. Uh, in the orchestras that you've been working with during the pandemic, mm -hmm. what are so, what's, some of, what's some of the good, the bad, and the ugly about some of the orchestras that are changing well and some that are resistant to their detriment? Yeah, well, um, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of good and unfortunately more bad and, and uh, probably even more ugly. Um, but it's the time that we live in, and you know the pandemic has just really uh, created a shift for the entire industry. So mm -hmm. something that had its a day, you know, heyday in 1880, is now really dealing with a lot of, of um, the fact that it's it's not been prepared for this. So mm -hmm. um, so I think you know change is um, it's something that you can prepare for. It's something that you can do well. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations wait for change to happen to it. You know, a catalyst, a spark. A pandemic, mm -hmm. a financial crisis, a flood, um, and then you know you know you have to change. You mm -hmm. know, the way of doing business is not going to be the way you do business tomorrow. Um, those who get out ahead of it realize that you know there is a way to kind of plan and figure out you know, how are we going to you know how are we going to move this this boat and 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 turn where we need to go. And those who do it well um, are seeing great things, and we see that in the industry even this year. Uh, those who have been unprepared um, are kind of um, you know, dealing with that, mm -hmm. and, and they will for, for many years, and, um, and, and those who, you know, are, are kind of stepping in the potholes um, are, are possibly going to go backwards. So one of the advantages, if you can call it that when you got here, you have the mother of all catalysts mm -hmm. with the flood, um, because I would argue that for an orchestra to change, it takes a lot larger and broader constituencies than the average layperson realizes. I mean, it takes the board to be behind an initiative, it's, it's the executive, it's the staff, it's the music director, already that's a high bar. Uh, but to do really meaningful change, you have to have the community and the musicians all pulling in the same direction. Absolutely. And uh, when you had um, the flood, which was so such a visible disaster. I mean, those who remember the flood, there was rubble on the streets and it looked like you needed a tank to get down, to get through downtown. So there was no question that every business was in dire straits. I mean, there was just enough visual information for people to just accept that mm -hmm. and to help us move in, in a direction to help us. Uh, more often than not though, symphony orchestras and nonprofits have this thing called a P&L statement and that if it's in red, and your and your balance sheet is not looking good, 
it doesn't have the same emotional impact, even though it could be just as dire, if not worse. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, and it, it could be the finances. It could be um, you know a systemic problem with uh, the culture of an organization. So uh, where morale is just weakened over time and just never seems to get out of that trap. Um, people who don't have a plan or stick to the plan and kind of go rogue and kind of pull the organization in a lot of different you know directions. So you know, all of those things happen all the time. But it's really hard to say, okay, we have to change this until we we you know until you need to. Right. I mean, you're right. The flood was. Uh, in a way, it was the biggest catalyst, the biggest spark uh, that we could have. Uh, and, and I think, you know, you've mentioned this before. People don't realize just how close um, we came to the orchestra not being in existence. I think we had, what, four months, six months of operating capital left before Chapter 11, if not Chapter 7? I mean, it was, it was awful. Yeah, well, you know, what, what we saw is, and, and, you know, at the time, the, um, you know, the symphony's identity was really tied to the Paramount Theater. And um, we forget that there was a period of a good three, four, six months that um, we did not know if the Paramount was going to come back. Right. And you know, there was talk about, well, what if we kind of built a new performing arts center? It was well on its way to becoming a parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so we knew, uh, we kind of saw that you know, if we were on the same timeline as like a Hancher, and you know, it's going to be eight years for us to get to a home, um, we were losing about 50% of our audience every, you know, year. every year. And we were not going to be around past year four. Right. Um, so the biggest thing for us is how do we bring change to a kind of get the Paramount back online and you know talk about change how do we take you know uh, the opportunity to um, build back better. Right. Build back better. You know the biggest surprise now this is what <laughs> 10 12 years in the rear, rear view mirror. Um, one thing that surprised me was uh, I think the center to that is, was to reach out to Iowa City. I mean, it's, it's insane not to reach out to a community that's 20 minutes away of 60,000 people who are arts lovers. Mm -hmm. um, and in the past, Orchestra Iowa or the Cedar Rapids Symphony then would just lob the occasional concert down there and you'd have more people in the audience, uh, on stage than in the audience. Yeah. And we kept on hearing, oh, it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. Um, until we actually made it a uh, part of our mission and every masterworks now is repeated down in Iowa City. But I will tell you this, I knew it was going to be a long haul because I think people don't understand how slow and how painful audience development is because when we first started literally there were more people on stage than in the audience and I tell you the musicians were angry with us. I mean they they were on our case yeah. and here we are 12 years later and we have a very loyal following there. Uh, you, you ran the numbers. We needed about 400 paying mm -hmm. audience me members to pay for that service. Guess what? We're, we're still 20 people short <laughs> on average. But I mean, at least it's like it's, with, it's within grasp. Yeah. My, my point is, it's taken us 12 years to get there. So I think anybody in the, in, uh, in the music industry is thinking that they can build an audience overnight. Right. I've got a bridge to, 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 to sell you. And I think the biggest lesson, though, is consistency and predictability. Yeah. And then you just have to suck it up and get through the pain. Yeah. And what you did there in Iowa City, because um, I remember that, that first season, um, you know, we, we, had a, we were averaging 150 people, you know, mm -hmm. in the audience. Mm -hmm. And it was painful. Mm -hmm. um, but in year two, that went to, you know, almost close to 300. And we started building this momentum. And so you really have to play the long game. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, have your plan and, and know when it's time to stick to the plan. We made tweaks sure. along the way. Yep. Um, I think you're seeing this with a lot of performing arts organizations now with the pandemic, which is, yeah, what's your short game? But more importantly, what's your long game? Mm -hmm. you know, are you going to be around in 10 years? Or are you going to be around in one year? Right. And, um, and, and for every organization, every community, it's different. Um, right. But it's, it's, it's part of strategy and tactics and, and how you create your, your plan. Interesting enough, there was a brief time where we had bigger audiences in Iowa City because it was the nicest venue because the Paramount wasn't open. So our, our audience in Iowa City went like this, and then once the Paramount opened up, it went like this. They all came back to the and then, and then it leveled out, and we were just like so close to having that magic number. Uh, because if you have 400 people paying for their ticket for that second uh, concert, it covers all our expenses for that. Uh, yep. And it's just economy of scale. Um, so without the, so, uh, let me put you on the spot because I'm hoping you'll say a few controversial things. Um, so in, in the flood, we had to mm -hmm. redefine space. We didn't have the Paramount, 
So we would play at a ballpark, or we, we would play at a school, we would play at Co. We would play wherever and wherever we could find a spot that had a large enough capacity for the audience as well as a large stage capacity for the whole orchestra. This pandemic is a different animal, but it too is also redefining space. Mm -hmm. Um, some orchestras have been doing online performances, mm -hmm. uh, some haven't. What are the pros and cons? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think for, you know, the first thing is, is when live performances got canceled, um, you know, it's in our nature to figure out you know, what, what do we do? You know, what, what, is, what, is, what fills that void? If it's not people coming to us, you know, are, are we going to go to them? Um, and, you know, a lot turned to the digital space. Um, we've been toying with this. We've been, you know, experimenting with it as, as an industry for, for several years. Uh, you know, you see concerts on YouTube, on Facebook. And so, you know, again, this was a kind of this catalyst to say, okay, we're going to move more towards this online, you know, content. Um, first of all, you know, not every organization has the same resources to put into that. Um, I could tell you that it is um, perhaps more expensive to do a, a well, a decent um, digital production than, um, than a live concert. Because you still probably have, you know, your hall, you know, expense. Uh, there may be, you know, still stage hands to set up, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the seats and, you know, the music stands. You know, set the lighting. Now you bring in, um, you know, audio engineers, Ed, production crew, video yeah. engineer, uh, Got and, it. Um, yeah. and you know, hopefully it's not. It doesn't just look like, you know, it's at somebody's middle school orchestra performance with, you know, a camcorder in the back. Right. Uh, so you know, you have some sort of creative, you know, element. Yeah. To one so, single so, shot. So way you go. Yeah. So they're, they're costly. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people try to find ways to keep their audience engaged. Um, for most of us in the orchestra world, performing arts, majority of our money is coming through contributed revenue. So we want to look at how do we keep the donors engaged. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people said, okay, look, you know, from this digital, you know, you know, um, platform, it's a great way. So you know, pros are it is a way to get out there. Um, you know, the con list. You know, in, in addition to being expensive. Um, uh, as expensive, if not more, than regular production. Correct. Um, you, you know, in my opinion, it's you have to be careful because it tends to be, for most organizations, a, a, a not a great representative of your a representation of your artistic product. You know, going to a symphony orchestra concert is a four-dimensional experience. You know, the, the you know the sound of the musicians' instruments come together and blend. You know, in the space. Um, you know, when the, when the bass section rips into something, you feel it in your chair. Right. And so you're moving from a 4D platform to a two-dimensional platform, and it sounds, you know, just like, you know, you know very stereophonic, you know, um, you know, flat experience. So, yeah, you know, but, you know, if you really wanted to listen to Beethoven 5, you know, is that the best, is that why you're going to go there? And, and the answer is no. Uh, it's also not a great product because, um, you know, a lot of our orchestras have been away for, for a while, so they're coming back and um, they, they're not performing regularly. So, you know, there's something about the ensemble playing. A lot is, of rust is, going is, on, yeah. yeah. And we now have social distancing requirements. So, you know, musicians are this far away. If we're in the wind section, we got a piece of plexiglass between us. Uh, we've got covers on our, our instruments. We can't hear each other. So um, it's, it's not putting out a very good you know, this is what we are. Uh, but the biggest thing is, you know, we, we look at the data and it's not really reaching a lot of people. It reaches kind of a core, maybe five, ten percent of your audience um, and, and maybe less of your donors that will probably likely still, um, you know, um, you'll be involved with you. And then, you know, it may reach, um, you know, friends and family of the musicians, you know, be, being performed. So it's just, it's, it's a really, um, it could be a it could be a poor return on investment. Um, however, much like this happy hour, what I'm seeing that's working really well is how do you keep the story you know alive? How do you keep people engaged and interested through you know connecting them? Um, and and so whether it's just you know inviting them in to have a conversation, or um, you know I'll, I'll you know drop the name of I think the group that's doing this the best, which is the Dallas Opera. Yeah. They have the whole TDO network where, you know, on one day they've got somebody doing master classes, they've got a conversation with the music director, uh, they've got, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a member of the orchestra doing kind a of lifestyle. A virtual network and, and of yoga. stuff that they're doing, yeah. And, and it's interesting. You know, people right. want to tune into something that will capture, you know, their, you know, their, their, their imagination and keep them engaged. Um, so there's ways to do that. It's uh, also not good for your product if halfway through your concert, Facebook shuts you down. 
Uh, yeah, and absolutely. And, and that, you know, Facebook has moved to really just kind of not wanting to get into music rights at all. So even if you're doing things that everything's in public domain, um, they are blocking every, everyone. And so people are moving off of the social media platforms yeah. that people are most used to. Right. So, so you know, it is something that's being right. done. But it, you know, there are people out there who say this is the future. Right. You, you know, my opinion, I think the minute that people feel safe going back to the live concert hall, um, that's where people are going yeah. to experience the work. Ed, which camera is on? This one? This one. So, um, I, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I was gratified, what I learned from the flood of 2008, and I gambled on, and I was proven right, is that Iowans stand up in a, in, in a crisis. Hmm. Uh, and they gave, and they continue to give very generously. Uh, the the idea of doing uh, performances online that are not representative or best was a real issue mm -hmm. for me. Um, but also, if this is really the, the wave of the future, which I agree with you, I don't think it is the wave of the future, only because that means musicians will slowly be replaced by production team. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when, you know, we, we can cover up a lot of sins when we can go back and splice and rebalance and you know uh, tweak the volume and all that sort of stuff um, but live performance i think it's going to be interesting when we get back it's going to take us a while to get the rust out and get used to playing acoustically with each other once and that's actually how i've designed our upcoming season which we haven't we, we haven't released it yet but it's coming but I, i've purposely designed it to be Fairly simple, uh, so that the ensemble will succeed, and it's only towards the end of the season that I, you know we start pulling out the big stuff again, yeah. uh, because if we start running before we can walk, I mean that's a that's a real issue. So I'm going to go to our chat room, see who's uh, following along, what smart ass comments they have, and then when I get back, I'm going to ask you, Robert, after you left Orchestra Iowa and Jacksonville, does size matter? Mm. Does size matter? So let's go back to our mm. comments here. Um, let's see here. Kurt Wasco, Tim, you know. Robert, you too. You know. <laughs> Denny, I'm out. Don Thompson, anytime. Um, you know what? I'm going to have. Is, do we only have four comments, or am I going to need some help finding these things? Because, yep. I see 18 comments, maybe. Do you see them? Yeah, it's the same issue. For some reason, I just can't follow the. Uh, I'm, <laughs> Yeah, bring this up. I got you covered here. Yeah. We're going to have a little bit of noise, and then we're going to stop. There that. we go. Okay. And there we go. There we go. There we go. There, oh, my God, there are actually there people go. out here. <laughs> yeah, Susan Anderson. Hola, from Hacienda. Margarita Toast. Great. Uh, we knew her as Jessica Mello. Uh, her last name is now what? Gully? Gully? Gully. Gully. You know Jessica what? Mello Jessica, Gully. forgive me. I haven't really met you again in your, with your new name. Well, yes, I suppose I have. Um, hi, Tim and Robert. Great to see you. Um, Don Thompson. What a great pair. Welcome back, Robert. You. You will, he lies so well. You know? <laughs> uh, the check's in the mail, Don. Yeah, Dead Re <laughs> Denny Redmond's drinking Jim Bean. Uh, Susan Anderson, happy 98. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Jeanette Welch. Hi, Tim and Robert. You know, I was just thinking of you because uh, she's the other one who laughs every time I use the shaker. Yeah. She's, she, too, <laughs> thinks of Leroy Anderson's sleigh ride. Literally, we were talking about that just like five minutes before we went live. Um, uh, Don Thompson, Belmead Reserve Bourbon. So, Don, are you going to start throwing down smack again against Denny Redmond's cheap choice in booze? Please do. Look. Good. I'm looking forward to, the, to his responses. Diane and Owen, welcome back to CR. Where are you living now? Someplace warmer than here? Let's stop it right, right there. Where are you living? Yeah, so right now we are living in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. And it took a while to learn how to say Louisville. Mm-hmm. You, 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 know, you, you, you put, you put a bunch of cotton Louisville. in your yeah. mouth. And, yeah. and so it's, it's like Jewel. But yeah, um, yeah. so um, uh, yeah, one, one of my uh, you know, first gigs after Jacksonville uh, was in Louisville. So that's where we ended up. And it's convenient to a lot of um, you know, cities in the Midwest. And they've got good bourbon. Really? They have, they have bourbon in Louisiana? They, 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 in Texas. Uh, uh, in where? Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Cut him off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. Um, so, 
Uh, there are different tiers of orchestras. There are community orchestras, which are all volunteer. There mm -hmm. are regional orchestras like I, ours, which are called per-service orchestras, in which we literally, the unit by which we pay our musicians is called a service. We pay them two and a half hours at a time, essentially. And so no. per unit, we're paying our musicians. And then there are salaried orchestras. And because of the pay structure, there are different ways of operating. But uh, does size matter, and are they the same problems with different zeros, or are they different problems? Yeah. So, you know, f so for historical context, I've now managed orchestras with budgets, uh, annual operating budgets as low as 500000 a year, where there was one other employee besides me, uh, up to about $15 million a year with 150 employees, counting orchestra and staff. And, you know, for the most part, you have many of the same problems. Um, there's office politics, there's some musician who doesn't want so-and-so as a stand partner. Uh, you may have a board member who's got his own agenda you know, out there that you've got to kind of you know, pull back in. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody uh, has an opinion of the music director's artistic vision. Oh, I know. So, <laughs> yeah. Keep it to yourself, please. <laughs> just, just no letters. So you see this regardless of the size of, of, of orchestra. What we know a lot is, is just scalability. You know, if you're operating in a community of 100,000, you, uh, you don't have the resources as a community of a million. And that's either you know, the human resources of talent or board, um, the philanthropic resources, the people who can support you. So, uh, so in, in some sense, it is you know, almost zeros. Um, the two exceptions that I would say that I, that I see is you know, the larger the organization, um, the more of a vertical structure that you have. And so it really takes a lot more effort to kind of communicate down and up. So um, you know, when, I, when I was here at Orchestra Iowa, um, you know, I think the, we were staff about a dozen, 14, and for the most part, we were all within 50 feet of each other. Right. So everybody kind of knew what was happening at any one time. You go to a large organization, you, know, you may be in the ticket office, and you have a ticket office manager who reports to a director, who reports to a vice president, who then reports to the CEO, um, and you may only see the entire staff once a month. Um, a, communicating down kind of mission and vision um, and getting kind of issues up uh, is, is more challenging. So you really have to rely on your systems, your protocols, um, and, and your people. Yep. There, there are things as a CEO that I have no, I, no clue about. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I had good people, and they knew, and right. that was good enough. Right. The other part that I think is important with size, you, you touched on it with the per-service orchestra. Um, large organizations, and nowadays you really almost have to be seven, eight million plus uh, to get to the point where you've got your orchestra on a salary with benefits. So that is their primary source of income. And you have, they have uh, contracts anywhere from like 30 to 52 weeks. And you've got that orchestra every time you play, you know, unless somebody's taking vacation. With the per-service orchestra, um, they may play two or three concerts a month. They may play two or three concerts a year. And um, constantly subbing people out. Yeah. Yes, because each of those musicians, they're playing with many other orchestras, or they have a teaching studio, or sometimes they have careers outside of music altogether. And so getting the same people in the same seats every time is impossible. And so that also in impacts kind of the artistic quality. So each one has its own sets of pros and cons. Um, you know, there isn't a per service orchestra manager who doesn't wish that they just had their orchestra all the time. And there isn't a salaried orchestra manager that doesn't sometimes wish that they had a little bit more flexibility in the fixed costs. Yeah, yeah. Or just to bypass the person of the last stand of the whatever section because they just can't play anymore. That's <laughs> <laughs> so an occupational hazard. Um, so what do you think is the, uh, we're about to go, we're about, we're all about to come back online now. Mm -hmm. Orchestras are. Um, What's your crystal ball uh, about this upcoming season? Is it? Do you think it's going to be a series of fits and starts? Is it going to be like through the roof? Do you think, um, you, you know, because actually I, I honestly think that um, financial hardship doesn't happen necessarily in a 24-hour circuit uh, mm -hmm. cycle. Um, you know, decisions that we make today and our budget realities today tend to crop up six months to a year down the road. Um, so when people say, what, why, did, why are you having so many financial difficulties? Well, you have to actually go back one, two, three years. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it's it's well, you know, it's a, it's a good point, and and I, you know, not to not to get off topic, but um, I really encourage organizations to almost have like a three-year plan, um, a financial plan, a financial budget, an artistic plan. You really should kind of have you know etched out what are you doing for three years, because that's the space of which we're operating. As far as the crystal ball, um, you know, it's it's. Uh, Unfortunately, it's, it's, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. And like many in the performing arts world, we've, we've been kind of navigating the pandemic. Um, you know, many of my clients, you know, we, we, I've either moved to digital or, you know, in some cases we've pushed everything back um, in looking at the summer, uh, summer outdoor concerts. Right. And, um, and even those are, you know, we're now seeing spikes come up again from, from COVID. And so what we thought was going to be a very safe, you know, third iteration of what the season could have been is now in jeopardy. And we're having to, you know, postpone and cancel some of those concerts. Um, the news today with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, you know, yeah, an 85% drop because of uh, the spoiled batch. Uh, well, yeah. And um, that um, they've, they've uh, the I, blood don't, I don't know the clinical yep. term, but with yep. the blood clotting. Uh, and we've got, uh, you know, we have variants out there that we don't really know the answer to. I think almost every orchestra and arts organization out there has a 21-22 plan. Um, if everything goes well, um, we get back on stage. Um, we have, we kind of walk into, you know, we, we enter the shallow end of the pool. So right. as you said, you know, starting with, you know, repertoire that, you know, may use limited forces. So we're not going to be coming out with our Mahler 8. Hope I didn't spoil that for you. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> um, things that, that we can perform safely. Um, but we also know that the typical audience for the, our classical music are going to be the ones who may be most anxious and most hesitant to come back to a live event. Yeah. And so I think many are budgeting at 50% or less capacity. Um, and um, and waiting to see what happens when we may still have to mitigate and cancel and move things around. It's, it's still a big unknown. You know, the arts are, we're flexible and we're optimistic and we're resilient. And so mm -hmm. all of us are saying, this is our new season. Right. But we're also in the back of our head saying, what if this is plan A of our season? And if we really have to, this is what we mitigate to. And then if we really have to, this is what we do. And we're, we're just always thinking that way. I'm worried that people's patients are going to run out. Uh, patrons, you know, uh, our patrons here have just been saints. Most of them have just um, donated their tickets to us uh, for mm -hmm. the year, and it's just helped an Im immense deal. And some have also just asked for, you know, uh, to, to reuse those tickets for a future concert, which is absolutely great. Yeah. I'm just worried about, if the, you know, if there's another surge or another variant, that we have to go to the well yet again. You know, to ask, you know, and, and yeah. there's, only, there's only so much goodwill that you can count on before people say, you know, give me a, give me a call when, and when you get your act together. Yeah. You know, I, but I, I think people really step up when they have to. And I think people realize that, you know, patronizing the arts, you know, it's, it's not a luxury. It's yeah. an investment in society. It's yeah. an investment in our culture. And I think, you know, they, you know, there are a lot of organizations out there saving the world. And then there are organizations like ours that are making sure that the world is worth saving. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we connect, the, you know, as we connect that message to people, I think that we'll have them. And you're right, Iowans are incredibly generous. You know, they're they're stubborn about that that generosity. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that gives me hope, and um, I believe it was actually your conversation um, um, with uh, with Andy from Cobble Hill. And you know the restaurant industry also really had challenges, and so they did all things from you know you know packaged meals for takeout to you see people giving kind of you know, recipes online that people yeah. can kind of duplicate, and they had this whole other you know replaced business model just trying to keep up, and it was popular, but the minute that restaurants started opening up, <sighs> that's what people wanted, and they couldn't right. even do that new stuff. So I think that whether it's in September or January. Let's just stop there for right. the optimist's sake. Right. Um, you know, every we we will be excited to return. Musicians will be excited to return to the stage. Audiences will be excited to return to the hall. And um, you know how we get there is 
um, we will get there together. Great. So I'm going to go back to the, the uh, chat room to see what's going on. And uh, when I come back, I want to talk to you about culture. You've been in three, uh, three very distinctive parts of the United States. We all play symphonic music. Uh, but what's the difference, and how do you present it? And uh, because people sometimes think a symphony orchestra is a symphony orchestra, and the answer, the, you know, the truth of that is beyond a 30-mile radius, they are not the same. So uh, what's going on here? Uh, Denny Redmond said, "Did uh, oh, did Robert bring us some Pappy Van Winkle?" Denny, I have something better for you. Oh, oh which which uh, which camera are we on here? Put it. Can you okay on that one? De so Denny, th this is, now this is a secret. So everybody else, I, I want you mute. to like mute. mute everybody. Wait, I don't think that works. They can still hear me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Denny, I have something better than Pappy for you because you're drinking Jim Bean, right? So you're gonna love what I, what I've got, and and I'll leave you that bottle to get to Denny. Okay, perfect. <laughs> because actually, when uh, we were talking back and forth, he said, "Should I bring anything?" I said, "Boutique bourbon." Yeah. Boutique Bergen, because, I mean, really. What? Let's see what's going on. Uh, anything else other than the Robert, uh, uh, rather than the Pappy Van Winkle over there? Is that the last comment that's come in? So. Okay. Um, so culture. Yeah. You've been here, the Midwest. You've been to Florida. You've been to Kentucky. Um, I assume we pl we've, all pl you've, we've all played Beethoven at all three of these places. Um, mm. But that's probably where the similarities have, en have ended. So yeah. how does culture and um, geography change an organization? Yeah, you know, you, you, you'll be surprised about the Beethoven comment. Um, you know, I, I think that there is kind of an artistic um, footprint of, of every organization, of every music director, yep. and, um, and of the community. And you know things that play in you know uh, we'll just use things that play in Peoria, uh, you know may be different than what you know plays in a, in a different you know different market. Right. And it's been interesting to see the, the juxtaposition of kind of the community taste mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a particular um, artistic footprint. Mm -hmm. and, and I say that because you know often it's the music director, but it's not always the music director. Right. Uh, one of the things we love in the orchestra management side is um, guest conductors. Because usually all the things that we want in a season that the music director doesn't want to play. Like Franck D minor symphony, for example. Damn. <laughs> That's what goes to the guest conductor. Just putting that out there, everybody. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's got <laughs> guest conductor written all over it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Was I too eager on that one, really? <laughs> <laughs> that much? Okay. Yeah, sorry. But, but you, you know... Um, you know, I, I remember being here and a particular um, um, beloved patron and donor, um, who, I, and I say beloved, I, I love this man. You're talking about John Smith, aren't you? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no uh, okay. Um, Get to that, that story later. That, that's, okay, that's what I'll do that. So, yeah. um, but no, th this person um, strongly recommended that the 1812 Overture be performed on almost every concert. Um, okay. Yeah, and um, if not at least once a year, right. and so really kind of meat and potatoes, um, right. you know, taste, you know, in that sector. Um, I went to you know an orchestra, and it, you know the location doesn't matter, but this was more specifically with the um, that new music director, who came from a school of um, really studying, you know, kind of the, the um, you know the, the 20th century Viennese school, so mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. from you know Schoenberg and Berg. And, oh yeah, everybody and, sang and along. Lincoln. Oh yeah. The only so this is the only time in my career that a soloist did not get a standing ovation. We did the Ligeti Piano Concerto, and during the concerto, and this is not an exaggeration, about 50 percent of the audience walked out, and when it was over. It was just like cricket, cricket, <laughs> cricket. And it's this incredibly hard, beautiful piece. At, well, no. <laughs> beautiful is not quite the right word. Yeah. Beautiful, so there. Um, but it's also, it's got like this, you know, chamber orchestra, you know, on stage. So everybody's just playing their hearts out. Right. Um, and, um, <laughs> and I didn't know if I was completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, um, so you know that that community um, really kind of struggled with you know what we were trying to introduce to to them. Right. Um, By the way, I just name checked John Smith for for example. We got to set the, the record straight. I learned something about John Smith because of you. 
Okay. Because John Smith loves the orchestra. He, he loves did. he loves this community. He 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 supports a lot of organizations, and he also does his homework. Uh, when yeah. he when he sees something coming up that he doesn't know, he'll listen to it. Yeah. And you know what? Because of you, I found out that John Smith absolutely loves the music of Bella Bartok. <laughs> Can't cannot get enough of it. In fact, he wants a whole season of it, front and center, in the loge. And you know what? He'll even throw his underwear for that. Uh, I just mark my words, John. I hope you're watching. <laughs> you want to tell the story? Yeah, yeah, John? please do. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so we did. Um, it was it was the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, which is a cult standard, you know, top fifty. Oh, here? Orchestra no, 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 no. It was uh, uh, strings, uh, strings, percussion, percussion cellist. cellist. That's, That's right. One. Which actually uh, was first featured in The Shining. It sounds like yeah. a horror movie soundtrack. Oh, yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. lots of viola, yeah, velvety yeah. tones. It's scary enough as it and is. So, then you throw in the violas. And so we did that. Um, uh, but there's two parts of the story. So we, we did this on this concert. And, um, and, and at, you know, I saw him. And I don't know if it was at intermission or, or after the concert. You know, he comes up to me. He's like, Robert, we need to do more bar talk. And I was a little surprised. And I'm like, really? And he's like, no! no! <laughs> yeah, I mean, who wants that experience of you know, listening to music that's accompanied with a chainsaw massacre but, or something? But about this concert, and I'm trying to, I don't know if you could remember what it was paired with. Was it Chike 4 or Dvorak? It was uh, something. I can't remember, yeah. Um, or it may have been a concerto. But this was at the time, I, I think we may have been in Co. Yeah, we were the, starved for uh, a real experience. So yeah. I remember, you know, because after a concert, I always go out where the people are. And as people were exiting the hall, you know, I like to pick up on what they say. And, you know, they were all talking about the soloist with this, like, really traditional, you know, mm -hmm. you know you know, peace. And it's like, oh, you know, okay, that's fine. But we also did that concert in Iowa City. And what the Iowa City audience was talking about was the bar talk. Was the bar talk, yeah. And so, you know, that's why we have this kind of diversity of programming because everybody has their own taste. So, yeah. so that was here, that was Jacksonville. Um, you know, I, I, I was at Louisville. And so the Louisville Orchestra actually has a, has a history because in the mid-20th century, they commissioned... Um, they did a lot of new music. Hundreds of composers right. to do new music, and they were the first orchestra to create their own record label. Yeah, that's, that's when recording was still relatively cheap. Yep. Back in the 50s and 60s, it was still kind yeah. of novel-ish, so it was actually quite a feather in your cap if you could be the first to record yep. something, just in case it became famous. And so the community really prided themselves on being that, that you know, kind of cutting edge. And still to this day, you know, when I was there and, and with their new music director, 50% of the works on the, the main classical masterwork season mm -hmm. were, are composed by living composers. Right. And the community eats that up. I can't think of another orchestra that can get away with doing 50% you know, living composers. Uh, which I actually think, but is that's a also great because it, it's go, had. That's because of its forty-year history of doing that. Yes, it's, getting, it's the culture. As get, you said. Getting back to my original point, it's taken us twelve years to get an, or, an audience in Iowa City. I mean, yep. but if we had thirty years of that, uh, it's a different ball game, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, because we couldn't do fifty percent new music in Iowa. Although I will tell you, uh, <laughs> as God is my witness, Ed, you'll be my witness here. Um, the year before. Maybe two years before the the, the pandemic, um, the metrics of our data changed. Um, there was a couple of concerts in which we switched out the overture mm -hmm. and we did something a little bit more off the beaten pack and and wild for Iowa City audiences and yeah. something a lot more conservative for Cedar Rapids audiences. And in those two years, we found out that the audi our taste and audiences of yeah. our audiences switched. And that our audiences in Cedar Rapids actually started thinking, hey, you know, I love the Beethoven, I came for the Beethoven, but this piece loved it. So, whereas some of our audience, our, our stalwarts in Iowa City were saying, you know, eh, eh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think people want new. I mean, if you just ate the same thing every day, you know, that right. would not be fulfilling to you. When I was here, and, and this wasn't my project, it, it was, you said it in stone before I got here, but the whole Made in Iowa 
right. project yeah. where you know you know an Iowa composer you know was put on every concert, right. and there were some great pieces that came right. out of that. In fact, pieces that we repeated multiple times. Eric McIntyre, yes, uh, Drive By, and you know uh, uh, you know another name drop here. But uh, it was Orchestra Iowa that commissioned Michael Doherty's American Gothic that got the Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Composition. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think we shortchange our public thinking that right. they don't want this. But right. in reality, they're, they're right along with us. But you have to, you, you have to engage. So we, we have some advocates here. Blaine Cunningham, uh, our uh, librarian. So he's a little biased, just just a little bit. He had but a great soul on yeah. American Gothic. Uh, he does. He, he, we, we, by the way, uh, after you left, we also did uh, Michael Dorder's Tuba mm -hmm. Concerto. The Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi. Oh God, help me, Blaine. Blaine what, what, was the, what was the Mississippi? What, what was Ryan. the name of the concerto? He, anyway, Blaine yes. did a brilliant job, and it was. <laughs> it's it's a beautiful. Beautiful it, damn piece. Because okay. when you think of tuba, sorry, Blaine, I'm still, you know, people don't understand, don't see it as a, as a solo instrument necessarily. And I would say 90% of the concertos out there would reinforce that opinion. Yeah. But Michael Doherty's piece, that was awesome. So yeah. let's see what that, you think, Blaine. You haven't tubby the tuba. Not, yeah, oh, exactly. Oh. So, but anyway, Blaine said he was in attendance for that Bartok concert in Iowa City. Uh, he loved it. I think it was uh, spring before he auditioned for Orchestra Iowa. There you go. Don right. Thompson. Here's another guy who loves new music. Yes. I think people want new. I like Robert's assessment. Uh, oh, Nancy Serduk. Um, can't wait for Live Symphony again, and I'm very happy with Iowa City resident. <laughs> Love you. Thank you so I'm much. Done. Tell your friends and bring them too. Uh, thank you. Yes, Reflections on the Mississippi. Thanks, Blaine. Doesn't. Yeah. Um, and um, Diana Nola, and she's right here, uh, Dougherty has become more melodic and easier to embrace. Uh, what, what happens with a lot of composers mm -hmm. when they're trying to cut their teeth? They're trying to be meaner, badder, more dissonant than everybody else, and thornier. And then with, if you're lucky enough, like Michael Doherty was, to actually taste international success, you sort of relax and you realize that people want to hear a good tune uh, in a completely new yeah. light. Because act actually, his American Gothic, the second movement, was down... The main melody, which which was lost on most people in the audience, was down in the valley. The valley so yeah. low, and he reorchestrated it and 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 camouflaged it so much, yeah. it just sounded like Doherty being Doherty. And the orchestration, I think it starts with that alto flute. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah, And yeah. it's just so so eerie. Yeah, uh, he, he, yeah, he's brilliant. You know, a lot of kind of contemporary composers kind of you know put him in this this box. Right. But, um, yeah. So we're, uh, sadly, we're already coming up to the end of our of our of our um, our time here. Uh, yeah. It's, but, but. <laughs> yeah. Actually, unless you want to pour us another, are you guys ready for some more? Are you? Do you have? A, do you need more time for a refill, everybody? Um, so actually, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna ask you this, and I would uh, ask you to be um, forthright, blunt, but somewhat politic. Okay. Uh, what were the pros and cons of Orchestra Iowa as compared to the other orchestras that you worked with? Mm. Artistically or administratively or in terms of vision? Yeah. Oh. No, th 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 it's, a, it's a good question. It's, it's actually something that, you know, not only do I think about a lot, but um, I, I talk about a lot to other organizations. Because, you know, the flood happened. We already discussed, you know, this was the lowest point for, you know, at the time, it was the lowest point for the orchestra. It was the lowest point for the community. Yep. And you know, you talked about you know all the you know just the the, the rubble and and you know the disaster that you know was downtown, but what I remember about that was the smell, right. that unmistakable smell that, that to this day I, I still have in my mind. Right. Um, and you know the only reason that we were able to survive um, was this collective people. Yeah. And you talked about you know the constituencies that go into this kind of cultural ecosystem of actually, of the actually hold that there. I want to say how rare that is. Uh, uh, you know, no, uh, symphony orchestras are notorious for like, you know, fighting cats that have been like that mm. had their hind legs tied together. I mean, it's 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 a tricky organism to steer. To steer. Yeah. So if you are having three, two to three constituencies out of five pulling in the same direction, yeah. you're actually ahead of the game. But we had yeah, all five. You you did well, and and so you know you have a you have an incredibly engaged um, board that's providing leadership, 
at the time where they're all dealing with their own companies and, and personal lives. Right. Um, our board chair, you know, you know, uh, Tony Golobic, you know, who had hired me. I mean, he, his his business is right, you know, down. He and, ran a lot of interference and, for us too. And, yeah. You know, so he's dealing with his own company. You know, Tim Charles. You know, Mercy had their own stuff going on, but if you look at, um, and actually, you know, I, I want to call this out because I think there should be two, um, two sculptures made in the Paramount Theater, um, one for Peggy Whitworth and one for Jim Hoffman. Yeah. Because those are the two individuals that saved the Paramount and, and got this restoration happening. Peggy was the first to realize its historical significance. And right, when people to, wanted to tear it down. Yes, yep. the historic renovation. And then once everybody said, okay, great, we are going to restore it. How are we going to do that? Jim Hoffman got the tax credit thing figured out somehow. And so those were two heavy hitters on our board of, of, among you know 38 others that really got this organization going. Um, the musicians, you, you know, musicians are very tied to routine. You know, they get up at a certain time, they practice at a certain time, they eat certain things. And, and so they're just used to, okay, this is my locker, this is where I sit. And when the flood happened, we were like, there is no locker. We've got to change everything. We're yeah. going to move you to a auditorium at a college. We're going to play in a high school. We're going to go out to the lawn of Bruce Moore. We don't, you know, we're, we're going to rehearse in a, in, you know, a gymnasium. And whereas probably many other orchestra musicians would have, you know, raised the flag and said, whoa, this is out of contract. This is, you know, we're not yeah. comfortable with this. Our musicians said, what do we need to do? Yeah. And we're going to meet you. There. I will actually shout out uh, somebody who just resigned, retired this year, uh, who was the head of the Players Committee at the time. That was Pete Tilly. Um, to have a gentle soul like that uh, leading the musicians at a time yeah. that could have been catastrophic. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, uh, you, you know, and so um, you know, obviously a great community that came, you know, uh, a funding, you know, uh, you know, our donor community that, that was there right behind us. Um, you know, but to me personally, the, the biggest driver of all of that, you, you know, as a CEO, you, you know, look, you and I have gotten a lot of credit. You know, yeah. we got our picture in the paper. We got awards. You know, I got a little trophy that still is on my, my you know, uh, desk. Um, that all happens because I had an incredible team. I had yeah. an incredible staff. You know, every one of them, you know, was, was a rock star. And, you know, they were the ones working 80-hour weeks, you know, just sludging through everything. Well, and when you have a binary system where it's failure, where, where, where the only other option is failure. Yeah. Um, it really galvanizes an organization. It does galvanize. Yeah. But people could always choose to leave and say, yeah. it's, not, it's not worth it to me. Yeah. So yeah. no one did it. Yeah. In fact, people came running saying, how what can, can I, I do? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, that, that to me, you know, when I look back at Orchestra Iowa, um, what set it apart was just great people um, wanting to do the right thing. And so... I was stubborn that we were going to be damn sure that we did not fail. Yeah. Well, because of you and the time that we were here together, uh, we bought this orchestra at least another 12 years. Uh, I, I think only a handful of people, most on the board, realized we only had a couple months in us before it was it was over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was over. Um, so I hope we are never in the position where we have our backs against the wall like that. Yeah. But it is also a teachable moment that when we all move in the same direction. Yeah. Uh, major things can happen. Major change can happen, and uh, it's <laughs> that is awesome. Um, I just wish it didn't take a catalyst for us, uh, a catalyst of a, of a yeah. crisis for that to happen. Well, so you know, and, and you don't have to because you know, talking before about kind of planning. You know, the, the key to all this is kind of co-creating. You know, the, the plan. And you mentioned it, you know, if you get your board, your staff, your musicians, you know, representatives of the community, your donor base, and you get together and you say, what are we going to do? This is north. Go. Yeah. Right. You know, your strategic plan is what sets your mission, your vision, your values. And, you know, more importantly, it also sets the organization's commitment <sighs> to resources to those values. Darn it. You just made me ask yet one last question before we sign off. The art of saying no. Um, so every orchestra has more ideas and more opportunities than they know what to do with, but they don't have the resources, either financial or human, or in terms of just human capital. And I'm just talking about of orchestras of any size yep. to get it all done. 
How often do you have to say no, even if it's a great idea? Well, you should say no. Yeah. You know, and, and because if you don't, and this is you know why you have a plan to say, you know, what is the most appropriate? Look, we all can think of a hundred great things to do, great ideas, but you can only execute well on three to ten of those. Right. And you have to collectively say, this is what we're going to do, and I'll take ownership of that, and then subscribe to it. When you get to the good, bad, and the ugly, the bad and the ugly come when people either aren't there for the strategic plan. And so this is important because, you know, you should be, every other year you should be doing your strategic plan because we have new board members joining every year. And I've seen more organizations get into trouble because they've got a great plan, but four years later they have a new board leader come on and say, you know, that's not my plan. And, and they start to pull the organization away from what everybody said. This, this is, is where we're going. going into. Yeah. So, um, so you know, you, you've got to be you know, vigilant. You, you've got to say, this is what we're doing with our resources. And, um, and, you know, to say no to things that aren't, you know, in that. Even if they're a great idea. Yeah, because this is where we get into mission creep. And we are seeing, here's another controversial, you know, statement. Um, where I see this happening more and more is um, donors. Mm -hmm. Donors who say, you know, I will give you X, but I want to see this. And it may not necessarily, it often doesn't reflect what the institution said is where we're going. Sometimes it gets as far as saying, I want this programmed, or I want this artist, or I think there should be a change in um, personnel. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for organizations to turn away money. And you've got to be very diligent and have a lot of institutional integrity. And um, if you don't say no, you're going to get into trouble. Yeah. So with that, I guess the the definition no. the definition of leadership is the art of disappointing people. <laughs> I and, and that has been my success. I, I can't think of anyone that I haven't disappointed. <laughs> So with that, uh, Robert, I, you know, when I reached out to you and you said you were going to come into studio and do this live, I thought you were just joking. And how long of a drive is it from Louisville? Uh, seven and a half hours, but this is where it all started. This is where it all started. It and and it, it was kind of, it was fun and also sad to see the look on your face when you came into Opus and you see it, and you see it kind of torn apart because of the derecho. Yeah. Even though it's on the mend, um, it's kind of hard to see your baby hurting right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cheers to you, sir. Miss you. Miss you, brother. Thank you very much. And thank you for, um, for everything you've done for us. I mean, it was, oh, it was my pleasure. It was quite a ride when you were here. So with that, everybody, uh, tune in next week. Join me. My guest will be Sean Ulmer, who is the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. And in the meantime, Robert's still going to continue drinking my booze. Cheers. <laughs>